You're listening to A Deeper Dive, a part of the Winsight Podcast Network. How will a subway sale affect the sandwich market? Hello, this is Jonathan Mays, and in this week's episode of A Deeper Dive, I speak with Michael Goldberg, the CEO of the 100-unit Ike's Lovin' Sandwiches. Goldberg has worked with the chain for more than four years, and we talk about all kinds of things, for instance, Ike's and its history and its growth strategy. He also talks about the company's catering program and its post-pandemic strength and how Ike's has had to adapt to that. Michael also talks about the return on investment the company gets from new locations. Ike's likes to move into closed locations, such as closed Subway restaurants. And that leads into a discussion about the sandwich market in general and what Subway sale could do to that market. Michael has some very interesting things to say about how that whole sale process has already had an impact on the market and what could happen after the sale is complete. We're talking sandwiches on a deeper dive, so please have a listen. Thanks, Jonathan. Great. Thanks for having me on the on the uh, podcast. Appreciate it. Cool. So, uh, Michael, tell us uh, what's going on at uh, Ike's right now. Man, we are just in in growth mode. I got to tell you, you know, I've been I've been with the organization about four and a half years, and just alone these last two years, um, we've opened up in the neighborhood of about thirty four units. This year alone. Um, we've opened up a, a, 11 units and we have seven more to go uh, by the end of the year, which uh, that one will be uh, kind of a big one down at Mission Rock in San Francisco, right between uh, the Giant Stadium and Chase Center, uh, where the Warriors play. And that'll be our 100th unit um, that we that we open up uh, probably somewhere around the first week of January. Mm-hmm. How many locations do you expect to, to have by the end of the year? End of the year will be right at 100. Oh, so right about 100. Right, okay. right at 100. And uh, at that point, we'll have about five to six more leases that we have signed either in construction going into Q1 of 2024. Mm-hmm. Does it uh, does it make I mean, does it does it make growth easier when you get larger like this because you get to about 100 locations? Does this start speeding up at this particular point? I've heard that before. I think it definitely does. I mean, we have a you know, we have our team in place. So as we as we kind of, you know, grow, um, you know, we're not adding team members to make that growth occur. You know, I have a I have a great uh, VP of development and real estate that that handles finding our real estate, putting the development together, putting cheats together, putting, you know, so as far as the the real estate side, I think it becomes easier. Um, You know, operations, you know, especially on the hiring side, the labor side is always, you know, the last couple of years have been a struggle. But. We seem to have hit a, a pretty a good plan on, on how we're hiring now, um, which we're doing a lot of the hiring right out of our support center here in Long Beach. A lot of Zoom calls with our recruiter. Instead of bringing it down to the store level, we're doing it all you know, in, in, at our support center, at least the initial interviews. Mm-hmm. So tell, for, for people who don't know, tell us a little bit about Ike's. Ike's first opened in uh, 2007 uh, by Ike Shahada. Um, it was in the Castro District in San Francisco, and you know it opened up to you know two hour waits. Uh, you know I created this concept out of uh, just a small little store. It was uh, a family um, convenience store. He came up with using uh, San Francisco Dutch Crunch bread is a big staple for the for the concept, and then he created the the famous uh, dirty sauce, which uh, it, it gets baked on every piece of bread. It goes through an oven. As it comes out, another cold layer of dirty sauce goes on, and then the sandwich is made on the on the finish side, and and it just became a huge, huge cult following from day one. And you know, as the story goes, he you know he changed the name from it was called Ike's Place, and then he changed to Ike's Love and Sandwiches because you know he really felt loves comes before sandwiches, and Ike's really into the love side of of life. Um, and you know, as everybody knows, we have somewhere around 800 to 900 sandwiches right now. Um, there's, there's big combination and you know, we have a lot of meat sandwiches. We have our vegetarian sandwiches and we have our vegan sandwiches. So there's, there's really no veto vote for coming to an Ike's. Um, you know, you can, you can love a pastrami sandwich on Dutch and you can also love, you know, just a, a vegan chicken sandwich on, on Dutch crunch. How many sandwiches did you say you had? There's, there's realistically, there's, there's 900 different sandwiches, but that being said, Jonathan, it's, it's, you know, um, there's 21 core sandwiches that are on every menu. 
And then their Ike for every location, Ike puts together two to four exclusive sandwiches. So two meat sandwiches, two vegetarian sandwiches that kind of involve the community or something that happened in that location. And his mind kind of flows to a creation of a sandwich. So you get to 100 units, you know, three to 400 of those sandwiches are just exclusively to certain places, um, to certain units. Um, and then, but we have the 21 core. And then from there, you know, we, we really have a top 10 sandwiches, you know, 75 to 85% of our customers order off of probably the 10 most favorite sandwiches that we have. So, mm-hmm. you know, everybody says to me, how do you train your staff to do, make 900 sandwiches? Right. But it's, uh, it's definitely, uh, it's, that's definitely not happening every day. Um, it's really focused on the, on the 10 top, top sandwiches. That was indeed my next question when you said that, but uh, since you've already answered that, that makes life a lot easier for me. And frankly, that's always better. But um, all right. So, but, but, but all right, that's, that's fascinating. So it really actually has almost a unique menu for each location. Correct. Except for those 21 core sandwiches, pretty much everything else is, is handpicked by Ike based off of the 900 different sandwiches. Again, same thing though. There's about there's about forty to forty two sandwiches on the menu board. You know, twenty five to thirty of them are are meat sandwiches. You mm-hmm. know, ten to twelve are vegetarian, and then we have you know anywhere from six to ten that are uh, vegan sandwiches. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm trying to imagine what a menu looks like with nine hundred sandwiches on it. Does Does Ike still do a lot of the sandwiches himself? At this point, I, is he, he still? Does- I, I mean, I creates every sandwich that 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 goes on our menu board. Um, you know, he uh, he's very involved on the culinary side. He's very involved on the marketing side, especially on the social media side. If you ever look at our channels or his personal channel, he's he's out and about all the time. Uh, we call it Ike out in the wild um, where, you know, he's he's out at the stores doing charity, fundraising, celebrity events. Um, and then, you know, and then we bring him, you know, to he comes to uh, all of our VIP nights and, and grand opening days for our, for our new stores, which, you know, currently we're, you know, we're averaging, you know, one every three weeks or so. We, we, we have a VIP night for friends and family and then a grand opening where we, you know, we still have anywhere from 75 to 100 people lined up by 930 in the morning to, to one get well, the first 50 are free sandwiches. And two to get a, a, a Ike's T-shirt um, for that location, and then three to meet Ike and have him sign autographs. I mean, it's it's an incredible thing. The the first time I walked through an airport with Ike uh, was in Phoenix, Arizona, and we literally got stopped five to six times for selfies and and autographs. Uh, and he's just, you know, there's you know he's the face of the brand. And when you think about it, Jonathan, there's not a lot of brands out there that 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 have a face. I don't, I can't even think of any that actually physically have the founder as the face of the brand. And that's on all of our logos and all of our signage. That, that, that's true. That is, his face is indeed on, 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 all, on the, on the logo. I, I forget about that. So um, now you've, uh, you've uh, are growing mostly through franchising at that, this point, is that uh, true or is it kind of a combination? No, it's, it's, it's almost 99% uh, company owned units. Really? So, we have, you know, we have about six to seven franchisees out there, and that's it. Everything else is uh, is is company units. And, and, that, and our that's plan, the plan. What's that? That's the plan going forward. Plan going forward. You know, we we really have a great ROI on our buildouts, and you know, I'm I'm not sure if you know kind of the the backdrop of the story, but we we take over you know, a tremendous amount of second generation locations. And when I came on board, or when I heard about the concept about six years ago now, I met Ike's partner, kind of a fluke meeting at the Chicago restaurant show at a function. And, uh, you know, he was telling me at that time they had 35 units open and 22 under construction or leased or ready to open, just sitting, waiting to open at that time. And he was telling me about their build outs and they're taking over, um, gosh, I think out of the 100 units, we'll be at probably 25 to 30 of them were subways and probably another 15 to 20 were um, uh, witch witches or togos. Um, so we, we take over the locations and 
back when you know I first heard about the concept and went and looked at it, um, they were doing build outs all in for about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. That's everything. Um, we were taking over subways that they leave the equipment. We put an oven in. We you know change the artwork, branded Ikes, and and physically open up the locations for one hundred and fifty thousand. Now today. Um, we're, we're currently running anywhere between on an average of 225 to 250,000 all in and opening. So wow. when you think about ROI, you know, it's, um, you know, cash return is just huge for, you know, especially where our AUVs are at and, um, and, and being able to take over the second gen is, is really key for Ike's. Mm hmm. So for, from your standpoint, then, that, that uh, ROI is so attractive and the cost of, of build-out is so low that it makes more sense for you to continue to operate corporate locations rather than jumping into the franchise game. It does. The only, the only, the only kind of negative to it, Jonathan, is that um, you know, if we went the franchise route, we probably could you know, grow faster you know, open up in, in different states and different, different territories and bring some good, you know, multi-unit, you know, concept franchisees in. Um, so that's where Ike and I have our discussions all the time. Um, we like the control. We like to be able to train our people the way we train them. We like to keep the culture in, in ta intact. And, you know, we worry a little bit about what happens when you start opening up units in Illinois or in New York and, and you know you're not out there as much so and culture is such a huge part of 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 what happens within the four walls of of the of the of an ike's loving sandwiches yeah that's an interesting that's an interesting point because we're, we're hearing about that element from more growth chains i mean a good example is dutch bros uh the beverage chain that that um has basically shifted away from franchising over time in part because of that cultural issue i mean you see other uh chains doing the same and i think one of like texas roadhouse and i think i mean a i mean people forget that you know you make more dollars by selling food to customers than you do selling franchises but then also like it's just easier to maintain that brand culture from from one location to the other yeah, I mean, Dutch Bros is like the perfect example and a kind of a funny story. We we just opened up our 10th unit in the Phoenix area. And I actually, my my uh, VP of operations, I, I kind of took them on a field trip, VP of operations, our area manager and our GM for a new location. And we went through the drive through of a Dutch Bros and the, the, the people, the crew members that they have working there are just so bubbly and excited to be working it you know it reminds me of starbucks you know 20 years ago you know and it's it's just an amazing concept and and what they put together and and maybe it has to do with that they are pulling back on the franchise side and and opening up the the, the company units yeah yeah for sure so you uh you mentioned subway and uh i wanted to talk a little bit about this um uh subway was sold last week What's your thoughts on the potential impact that could have on the market? What's your what's your general thoughts on that? They're a large competitor. Well, well, I mean, we consider ourselves a little more premium than Subway, but obviously they still are a competitor of ours. Um, you know, the first thing I thought about, I was on vacation last week when when the sale occurred and my phone started, you know, ringing and emails started coming in and, you know, I thought to myself you know, all Ike and I are really looking for is about one and a half percent of that purchase price. And we'd be happy to do something with our brand if the right private equity group came along. That was the first thing that came to mind. Second is, um, you know, all the news of, of Subway, not only in, in the industry and all, you know, all the things we get every day, um, it's really put sandwiches out, you know, front, you know, and, and it's been great for Ike's. Not only Subway, but Jersey Mike's, the whole Danny DeVito series and billboards and sandwiches out. I mean, it just triggers in people's heads. I want to have a, a, a great sandwich today. Um, so I think all the news that's 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 happening and it is is really positive for the whole industry, but really for the sandwich sec sector of, of restaurants and, um, you know, Subway. 
you know, you know, they did their subway series. They brought in celebrities and athletes for commercials. And, you know, now they're doing slicers in all their locations for the freshness. You know, we've had slicers, obviously, since day one. We slice our meats, all of our proteins, all of our cheeses probably twice a day. Not as in your face as a, as a Jersey Mike's, but you can see our slicers going throughout the day. And, and so, 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 I mean, that's a great move by Subway. Um, you know, I go back to, you know, when I listened to, to the CEO of Subway at uh, RLC last year, and he kind of exactly went down that line, right? He said he was going to, you know, get his marketing out front and center. He was going to uh, do some huge deals abroad, overseas, which he's accomplished. And he's got his same store sales up, you know, 10% basically year over year. Um, obviously, that's also with a 30% price increase over the last two years. But, um, you know, I still think there's a struggle there for at least the United States franchisees for Subway because they're starting out at such a low AUV. I mean, our AUV is about double that. And I know where our bottom line is. And if we had to give away eight to 10% back to a, the franchisor, you know, I'd probably think twice a little bit about what we're doing here. So um, I think there's still that struggle that, that's occurring, you know, at, you know, ground zero for the franchisee for Subway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they probably, um, you know, if you talk to any, Certainly, if you talk to any franchisee, and I talk to a lot of subway operators, they'll tell you that the brand probably still needs to close a lot of locations. Given your growth strategy, could possibly open um, some some development possibilities over time. Could that not? Absolutely. I mean, I think there's like like three points on on subway franchisees, and one is exactly what you said. There's just too many, too close together. Um, between, you know, strip centers and then a gas station. And I mean, they're just all over the place. And I don't know how they can raise their AUVs uh, when they have so many locations. So I think I think that's number one. Um, I think number two, I, a lot of the franchisees are very like kind of generational family owners. Right. And they're down now to, you know, the, the, you know, their their grandkid that's 20 or 25 years old. And I know my boys are, you know, 24, 26. And the last thing they want to do is work in the restaurant industry in the four walls. They'd be interested in the restaurant industry, but not working in the four walls of the restaurant. So I think that's part of the struggle. And then, you know, I, I think landlords and where we're taking advantage of it is they're looking, these strip centers and landlords are looking for the next exciting concept to complement other exciting concepts that they put in there. Um, you know, we just signed two leases that were subways that the subway has been there for 20 years. The, the, the franchisee wants to stay, but the landlord wants to bring in a, you know, a sexy, new, fun concept that'll drive, you know, people to their to their centers. And, you know, I think the same thing is true with like a Baskin Robbins. Right. You know. Now we have handles coming in. Now we have salt and straw coming in, and they're replacing that kind of that kind of ice cream section of of those strip centers. And Crumble's another example. You know, we're you know, it, it's turned into now. You know, Ike's is in a center. Chipotle's still in there. Um, we're not even concerned if a Starbucks is in line anymore. You know, most of them are drive-throughs. That huh. used to be big for us, but. You know, we like to see a handles, a, a, a crumble, um, you know, a Dave's hot chicken, you know, like, like those to us are kind of the ideal pairings for us to move into these strip centers. So I think I think that's part of the issue is, um, you know, you know, I grew up in the you know 80s and 90s and Subway was our go to place. I mean, it's an iconic brand. I mean, it was, you know, I grew up in Chicago and we go to, you know we go to Subway once, twice a week, and we go to Baskin Robbins once or twice a week. You know, that was where we went with, 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 you know, my family. And, um, you know, I, so I'm not sure where they had to, to kind of get some excitement around the brand. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think, you know, obviously there's a lot of money behind it right now and there's, there's definitely, you know, Rourke's going to be looking for their ROI on their investment eventually. And, and I, you know, I think if it's not overseas, they have to figure out a little bit what's happening in the States here. Yeah. 
you uh, you bring up one interesting point I wanted to, to ask. So, so some of it a little bit. So one of the things you're saying is that um, landlords, uh, retail developments play a role in some of these legacy brands growth that essentially as a brand sort of gets older and tired. And if, I mean, to me, it would seem like a risk going forward for some of these legacy brands if they can't turn things around and they have a lot of lease locations then these landlords are going to say well we don't want you in our development any longer we're going to go with this hot new rival because we need to bring foot traffic to our development 100 percent um and and we've proven it you know that we we bring that foot traffic from the day we open up, um, you know, we open up so strong and we have lines out the door and, and we, you know, our PR firm and our social media side of it is, is it's just huge. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're bringing the people to the center. So uh, you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a struggle, I think, for, for the subways, um, you know, uh, of the U.S. And, um, you know, again, the perfect example is, you know, how, you know, handles and crumble and all them are being able to come in and take over such legacy brands like Baskin, 31 flavors, and, you know, some of the others out there. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Like when you move into an old subway or like, whatever, pick, pick the, pick the, pick the brand, like, yep. is, uh, is it just your name? Is there something that you do to get customers to those particular locations? I mean, is there something that you have to do to say, I mean, or or you just do your normal market. You probably have this down to a to a science at this point. Yeah, I mean, right now the biggest issue is just getting them open on time, right? Mm -hmm. It's just the construction side of the business is uh, really taking a turn, mm -hmm. and the permitting and inspection side. So that's our biggest struggle right now. But as far as getting awareness, I mean, we you know we used to black out the windows. Now we put in full you know advertising for Ike's throughout all the windows as construction's going on. We, we offer on the windows, you know, QR code to join our, our rewards program before we open. So we start actually, you know, um, sending emails out to everybody that's actually signing up. And you know, it's, it's really incredible, especially when we open a, you know, a new one up in the Bay Area. You know, we could have, you know, 1,000 to 1,500, you know, people sign up before we even open up the door. Um, so we, we really get the awareness out there. We, we put out great press releases on when we're coming and, and, and when we open, you know, we, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it's an all ditch effort to really kind of get the buzz going um, before day one. Um, and the brand speaks for itself, um, you know, and, 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 you know, especially Bay area, now Southern California, we have four locations in, in Austin, or excuse me, five locations in Austin, Texas. We're opening the sixth one in two weeks. Um, we have 11 locations now in the Phoenix market, and we've finally proven it out that it can cross state lines and still start getting that same buzz. And we really realize it, Jonathan, on our grand opening day, you know, when, you know, when we still create the buzz of having 75 to 100 people in, say, Gilbert, Arizona, three weeks ago um, on a 110 degree day. And they're waiting in line to meet Ike, to have a sandwich, and really experience the whole culture of Ike's. Hmm. 110 degrees, really? Maybe 120. Man, man, those people in Arizona are made out of different things than me. 120 <laughs> degrees is yeah, it's hot. Um, but I, you know, I live in Minnesota, man. You know, yeah. 90 degrees is like don't even. Anyway, so you you mentioned a trigger phrase to me, and that's uh, permitting and construction challenges. What's going on there? It's tough. Um, you know, we've been fortunate. We have a great uh, equipment vendor down here in San Diego that that we you know we knew we were going to open up you know close to twenty units this year. So we we pre ordered all of our ovens that we use. We pre ordered a lot of our our tables that we use for finish and and um, and uh, so so we put our equipment in place. So we don't really have an equipment issue. Plus, we take over a lot of second gen locations that they leave a lot of equipment behind. We refurbish it. We have a team that refurbishes old equipment for us. So we, we try to use the equipment that's been left behind. Um, but we've had a general contractor that's worked for us really for the past, you know, probably since 
2000 and a, a 10, 2011. So he's got it down to a pretty good science. Uh, science. He's got about six people that work for him that uh, you know get the get the locations in shape. Um, it's really about getting the last inspection, getting the health inspections. You know, the counties and the cities. You know, since the pandemic, you know, where they used to come out or used to be able to even pay a little bit more to come out and, and you know, come at an earlier date, that's kind of gone. And so it makes it hard to get to the finish line um, and get the stores open. So we're averaging two to three weeks probably past our opening date, which isn't bad for some of the stuff you hear out there. But um, you know, a lot of a lot of our uh, locations, when we take over second generation, we just really have to get health and we really don't need building um, inspections. So it's really, really on the health side. One of the things we're running into, though, is that since we have, you know, we, we double an AUV of a subway, we try to use the same make line. Um, it doesn't give us the ability to handle our huge catering business that we have now. Um, so. We're starting to look at, you know, is 250,000 build outs worth it or do we add another 50 to 75 and kind of move the counter around, get a second oven in there, get a second make line for our third party services and for our uh, catering side of the business, which, as I said, is just it, it's taken off since the pan, since the pandemic. It's really, it's really huge. Your catering yeah. business yeah. has seven to 10 percent a week in business is is all catering. Really? Yeah. Huh. What, what type of events do you end up catering a lot of? It's not really events. It's it's just it's just uh, corporate really? lunches. You know, if you take like we have a ton of locations in Silicon Valley, Cupertino, San Jose area, and I think what they're doing is the Facebooks of the world, the Apples, the Googles. They're you know they're bringing people back to work. They're not opening up their commissaries anymore in house, and they're they're kind of talking through the process saying, okay, you know, Wednesday is going to be Ike's day. Huh? Wait a minute. They don't have free food at Google anymore. How are those still free food. Live? <laughs> it's still free food to the workers, but not, uh, yeah. they're paying us instead of, uh, cooking it themselves. Right. Yeah, that's so it's, it's a positive. Oh, oh. all right. Well, that's interesting. I guess I shouldn't mock that since I'm a restaurant writer and I get free food all the time, but <laughs> But uh, I care about some of their habits of eating. It's, it sounds like you get out there. Uh, well, you know, uh, it, it's you know, it's important to try the food. That's a legitimate. Sure. It's it's that's not that's that's I, I'm, I'm you know, it's to me, it is actually legitimately important to try the food of the stuff that you cover. Um, that's uh, you know, it's important. That's why, in fact, when I was in Southern California, I went to Ike's because I hey, I'm like, oh, well, let me try Ike's. I've heard good stuff about it. And uh, it was delicious. Um, so great. it's really good. Um, Michael, this was fabulous. Really appreciate you joining me this week on the podcast. Yeah. I, uh, thanks for having me. I just want to give you a shout out. You know, my whole team loves RB Daily. We listen to four minutes on the way to work every morning. And we talk about some of the, 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 the stuff you guys talk about. So, you know, it's my go to at 615 in the morning. So it's the first thing that comes on in my car. So I really appreciate what you guys do. Very nice. Thank you very much. Always love yeah. plugs for RB Daily, which is a, a great daily podcast. Sir, thank you so thank much. You. Thanks, Jonathan. We'll see you. And that should do it for this week's episode of A Deeper Dive, which was edited, as always, by Kimmy Spoons Kazmarek, artwork by Nico Hines. You may find this and other episodes of the podcast on our website at www.restaurantbusinessonline.com backslash article backslash deeper dash dive. And please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. I'm Jonathan Mays, your host, podcast producer, and the editor-in-chief of Restaurant Business. Thank you for listening.